Welcome to a friendly cause for the grand unpacking video. I'm not much of a video game collector. I wouldn't say I have a retro video games collection. What I do have though is my collection. I have the games I grew up playing. I have the games I've continued to enjoy as an adult. I've been lucky enough, never had to permanently throw anything away. I've always had a friend who would take things off my hand and look after it and be trustworthy enough never to lose it on my behalf. So as of 2021, I've been able to go back and collect all of those missing games. I've been able to put them out of the boxes and find a place to unpack them and store them permanently. And this, just in time for Christmas, is the grand retro games unboxing of a friend remembers. Well, here we are. It's all out of boxes. Let's start unpacking it. Here is where we'll put our first game and we're choosing it from the Sega Mega Drive. So here I present to you Aladdin. This game came out on the Sega Mega Drive in the early 1990s. It's a really faithful reproduction of the Disney classic movie. It was actually animated by some people from Disney itself, produced by Virgin Interactive. Really solid platformer, quite difficult to get to the end without using cheat codes or other things, but yeah, that's the first one in the collection. On the shelves it goes. And what do we have next? And oh, now this is a very, very old platform game. Alex Kidd, that's uh, Sega's attempt to have a console mascot before they invented Sonic. So this was supposed to be a Mario competitor and never, never even remotely reached that, um, that height internationally, I'm afraid. But it's, uh, it's a fun game to play and, and Enchanted Castle is definitely one of the better ones in the series. So what do we have? Okay, this one, the packaging is just a little bit, a little bit faded. It's coming across there, but Art and Senna Super Monaco GP. I've already done a video on this one. It's a really, really solid racing game. One of the best ones on the Mega Drive, actually. So that can slide in. Next we have Batman Returns, adapted from the movie. Again, I don't think I've actually finished this game, but I do remember playing for the opening levels quite a few times. It's quite dark, quite moody, controls quite well. That was a, a fun game to replay. I'll have to revisit some point. Then we have, oh, Bubsy. I forced myself to become good at Bubsy. I don't think I've actually finished the game, but I definitely reached the final boss. And after, in a game which pretty much is built around one hit kills, um, not very frequent checkpoints, and for a platform game where you die from gravity damage if you fall too much, it's incredibly aggravating if you let it get you. There is some really good stuff here, but it's hidden behind so much just obnoxious game design. It really could have been sorted out with just a little pass round, but yeah, I forced myself to get good of it. I got to the end of the game, I saw the end and said, no, no more, we're stopping here. So onto the shelf goes Bubsy. Then we have Again, I've done a video on this one, Castle of Illusion. This is produced by Sega, it's before they brought out Sonic, they wanted to prove that they could do their own platform series, and they reached out to Disney to get hold of the Mickey Mouse license. Really, really solid game, I've completed this quite a few times. It's excellent, it's not very long, you could complete it in just a few sittings, but I uh, definitely had a lot of fond memories with this one. Then we have Oh, a game that I'm not sure if Sega ever will actually want to officially re-release because they don't like calling him Dr. Robotnik anymore. But yep, yeah, Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. It's a quite an interesting title. It's a, it's a franchise take on Puyo Puyo. But um, oh, if for anyone who's familiar with the adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon series, it's got some really delightful character designs. And goes that one. Next we have, now that is a stone cold classic. Echo the Dolphin is one of the most important but forgotten games on the Sega Mega Drive. It's not a platformer, you've got three dimensional movement as a dolphin swimming around in water. It's more of a survival horror game, but from before that genre really existed. Your job as Echo is usually to get, to get from A to B by completing puzzles and quests along the way. You've got to do it for getting through caves without getting lost, without drowning, without being eaten by sharks or octopuses or other things along the way, but it gets really scary towards the end. There's some really smart design here, 
and yes you probably don't go into it thinking this is a survival horror game it looks really good it sounds really good but if you fool yourself and fall in love with the atmosphere this is one of the best looking games on the console in goes echo the dolphin and we've got another echo game now straight in with the sequel echo 2 the tides of time produced by the same team who made the first game there's some really really good and excited stuff here doesn't quite do anything completely unknown in the first game. Then we've got Arcade Shoot'em Up. I think this is based off an arcade game. It's uh, quite a nice simulation shooting Galaxy Force. I, I don't have a lot of strong memories about it. I think my brother enjoyed playing it quite a lot. It's a good game. It's a good game. I'll have to come back and revisit it one day. And the last entry on this shelf is going to be Jurassic Park. Now this again, movie tie-in release, but this was a really solid one. I had a lot of good times playing this. You've got two versions of it where you can play either as Alan Grant or the Velociraptor from the original Jurassic Park movies. Playing as the Velociraptor was a really, really fun and empowering experience as you basically carnage your way through the island. Playing as Alan Grant the other one was always found a little bit annoying because you can't actually kill any dinosaurs. You can just tranquilize them and hang around too long and they get up again. And that always irritated me slightly. But there we go, that is one complete shelf. Ah, another Disney game. This is The Lion King. Produced, I think, by the same team who produced the Aladdin game. This basically allows you to replay your way through the original movie. You go from young Simba towards Simba. It's got quite an incredibly high difficulty curve, particularly the Hakuna Matata level, which, okay, maybe it's not difficult, but it's really annoying. Get through that though, and yeah, this was a visual delight when it came out. Probably hasn't aged brilliantly though. I'm pretty sure this and Aladdin have been repackaged and re-released on modern consoles, and yeah, had quite a bit of negative appraisal on that. Next up we have, oh now this is a classic. Micro Machines from Codemasters. This is a really excellent game where you drive these tiny cars around you know, modern household day surfaces. Keyboards, sinks, bathtubs, kitchen implements, around the garden. There's also boats, I think, and maybe some other uh, vehicles as well. So there's a lot to explore, a lot to unpick, and for competitive local multiplayer, it actually boasts on the cover that has eight player local action. Well, my Mega Drive only had the two controllers, so I think we were limited to that when we played it. But yeah, it was a really excellent competitive local multiplayer. In goes Micro Machines. Next up, uh, Quack Shot. Now, I actually only permanently added this to my collection recently, but I remember renting this game quite a lot from when we were, when we were younger. Um, it's, not my, it's not made by the same team who did Castle of Illusion or World of Illusion that we're going to come to. But yeah, it's in that same genre. Donald Duck is always sort of the unlucky one out from the Disney franchise, and this continues it. Yeah, it's uh, got a really smart mechanic of using that plunger both to shoot enemies and as a platform aid where you shoot a wall then jump on the plunger and then jump and shoot again and ascend by sort of mounting these plungers that you fire to the wall. There's uh, quite a lot of different quests as you travel around the world. It's a really well put together package. It's just not quite as fun as the Mickey Mouse games because all those added extra elements, they definitely make the game more complicated but do they make it more fun? I'm not quite so sure. Next up, now we're here we have one of the most underrated gems on the console, Rocket Knight Adventures. This is one of Konami's, Konami's late masterpieces where they introduced their own blue mascot platformer. But unlike Sonic, this guy's this guy's not a rip-off of Sonic the Hedgehog or Mario. He's got something truly genuinely unique to him in the form of the jetpack he wears. The entire game is built around this mechanic of using that jetpack to move around. It's a completely different way of managing your momentum to Sonic, but there's a lot of fun to be had there. Next up we have R. Now this is an EA Classics re-release, but again, I remember borrowing the original game from one of my friends. It's Rolo to the Rescue. A really cute, cuddly, quite long and complex though 3D platformer where you play as this little cartoon elephant and you're rescuing all of the other animals from a, I think it was a zookeeper. Yeah, I've got some good memories of this game, but I've probably not touched it in almost 15 years. 
Then we come to the big hitters for the console. The original Sonic the Hedgehog wasn't actually my first exposure to the franchise. I think the first Sonic game I ever played was Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Then I probably went back to Sonic 1 after I gave up at the barrel level at Carnival Night Zone. Sonic 1 and Sonic 2 though really drew me into this character and showed me that barring that one obnoxious decision on the level design, this is a fantastic experience. But I think because I'd experienced Sonic 3 and Sonic 2 first, Sonic 1 always felt just a little bit aged and dated. Still, it's a very good game and well worthy of its reputation. Not quite as worthy though as its sequel. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is justifiably lauded. It's a really fantastic masterpiece. It holds up even to this day and I'm really looking forward to the Sonic Origins collection to finally get to play this in widescreen on a modern console. In goes Sonic 2. So I think you can guess what game is coming next on the list. We've got Sonic 3. As I said, it took me years to finish this game. The barrel in the Carnival Night Zone, the level that's on the front cover of the pan release. Now, you may have noticed if any of you are familiar with Sega Genesis, American or Japanese games, Europe had very different cover art. And Sonic 3 is one of those ones that I look at and go, I, I actually really like this design. Although it does remind me of my most hated level in the franchise. Still, really like this game. Once I eventually figured out that I was an idiot and there was a really simple way of getting past that barrel, came back and I've completed it several times. But I never completed it until after I played the sequel. Of course, it would end up being Sonic and Knuckles that really dragged me into the franchise. A Sega Genesis game with lock-on technology, this was truly revolutionary came out and probably one of the best Christmas presents I've ever received. And we're not done with the Sonic love because next, we have Sonic Spinball. Now, this is a little bit of a weird sideways move of the game. It doesn't play or control anything like the others, but it's got some charms, it's got some fun. There's a lot to love here. And I just wish the game was longer. It's designed for replayability, but with only just four areas, really you can get bored of it quite quickly. So, there we go, shelf number two, another 11 Mega Drive games down, and I think I've just got a few more to move into shelf number three. So here we have, what's next? We have Sonic 3D. The final game for the console, and a little bit of a weird one. This was 1996, really they should have jumped straight to the Sega Saturn, and in a way they did because Sonic 3D was re-released for that console later, but it didn't impress an evil one. It was just a little bit too ambitious for the Mega Drive and just a little bit not, not ambitious enough for the Sega Saturn. I really enjoyed it, but I can completely see why well, the general gaming media sort of passed over this release. This was not where Sonic needed to go next. Had it come out two years earlier, probably would have been a masterpiece. Then we're done with Sonic for the Mega Drive, so what do we have next? It's Strider. That's a really fun game. It's an action hack and slash. Um, I remember that the sword occupies quite a large proportion of the screen, but despite that, it's by no means a pushover or walk in the park. I remember there being quite a lot of difficulty in getting through this game, but yeah, definitely had some strong, fun memories of that. Then we have Taz, the Tasmanian Tiger in Escape from Mars. Yeah, that's... I don't know if I've ever finished that game. I definitely remember the opening two areas quite vividly. You start on that Mars prison as pictured, and then there's a rocky sort of desert type level next. The just fundamental controls of pressing a button to make Taz spin into a sort of whirling tornado, that was really fun to control, but I don't remember much else about this game after that point. Then we have, ah, from the same team that made Sonic 3D, we have Toy Story. Another movie time, but this one's just a little bit different. It was designed to look and feel as close to the three-dimensional CGI Toy Story movie as possible, and yet this will be where Traveller's Tales really made their mark. It looks absolutely fantastic, and yes, the box does advertise that this is a 32 meg game, larger than most others for the consoles, but it looks the part. It plays brilliantly, and there's a bit in the middle, if you get far enough, the bit in the in the movie where they go into the machine, the claw, to try and rescue the aliens and get out of there, that actually turns into a 3D dungeon crawler. 
Which, okay, it's not the only game on the Sega Mega Drive to attempt this, but it's it's incredible what they managed to do. So that's Toy Story. What else do we have? Just a few more games to finish up. We have World of Illusion. So I referenced this earlier. This is the true sequel to Castle of Illusion. One of the best cooperative platform games on the console. You can play as either Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck, or both of them together, as they work their way through these sort of different lands to try and escape from a magic mirror trap. It's really, really fun, both to play on your own and to play competitively with a, with a friend, where you can, you can whiz this cape the magic magician's cape to uh, tie them in knots and just annoy them. Uh, definitely had a lot of hours messing around on this game. So, in that goes. That's it for the Sega Mega Drive, but I've got two other games left to add for it. Three other games left to add to it, actually. The first one is the only game I don't have a box for. I can't remember where we picked it up, probably in some kind of second-hand car boot sale, but Desert Strike, where you control a helicopter flying around, I think, the um, the Gulf. It's part of the Gulf Wars, and basically completing a little task to try and rescue people and blow up enemy combatants. It was quite fun to mess around with. Definitely a good purchase from the car boot sale. But the other non-boxed item I have is the unofficial Pro Mega Master Converter. Now this is a little device that plugs into the Sega Mega Drive slot and it allows you to play Sega Master System games. Little known fact, the Mega Drive and the Master System are built on pretty much the same architecture. They're not automatically backwards compatible though, because Master System games just won't fit in the Mega Drive slot. Use this device and you'll overcome that problem. And I've got two Sega Master System games which I could try out with this device. The first one being, of course, the 8-bit version of the original Sonic the Hedgehog. That actually, there's some arguments that it's actually a better game. It's probably, in my opinion, the ultimate 8-bit game ever made for consoles. I'm sure a lot of people would shout me down for that. But this uh, took the original method of controlling Sonic on the Mega Drive for the original Sonic 1, and it paired it down perfectly. It doesn't get too overambitious. Everything controls is butterly smooth. But it's just really fun, excellent music. It, it's similar but not the same. It's doing its own thing and it does it brilliantly. And I also went and purchased one other Master System game, which is Sonic the Hedgehog 2. It's not quite an improvement on its predecessor. It's by no means a bad game, but there's just a couple of decisions in the early levels that really, really irritate me. Firstly, there's the boss in the original zone, the underground zone which just throws, uh, this is the game that really made me wish that they gave you rings so you could survive a hit in the bosses. And the first level boss throws these balls into the air that bounce down and all you've got to do is avoid them and it's really finickety and irritating to do. It's not as irritating on the master system because you've got a wider screen and you've got more warning of the balls coming to avoid them. But the second reason is there on the front cover. I didn't get on with the hand gliders, it just could never quite figure out the controls. I've managed to get through that level but not repeatably and not without dying at some point. Probably if I put the effort in I'd figure out the controls but it's just it's a gimmick that irritated me. But if we slide that in we have a complete shelf. There we have the non-boxed games on the right then the master system and then alphabetically my entire Sega Mega Drive collection from A to W. That collection may strike you as incomplete. There are some pretty significant Mega Drive games missing. But remember, this is back in the day when, in the school ground, we'd trade console games with each other and we'd borrow them from blockbusters at weekends when we wanted to try new experiences. There's so many games I loved as a child that I never owned, just temporarily had access to. And it's pretty much the same now on online with emulation, so just because you can't have a physical copy doesn't mean you miss out. But Sonic 3D really was the end of my love affair with console gaming for a while. I had friends who bought a Sony PlayStation, and I had a quite complicated relationship with that console. I genuinely adore it, it had some fantastic games, but my passion was slowly drifting towards PC gaming. And eventually, when I was able to persuade my parents to buy a family home computer, the game that was released alongside it, that sort of sealed the deal and said, this is the one we want, one that I'd been playing regularly at a friend's house as we'd explored it together, 
was Tomb Raider 2. This really was a fantastic, it's probably still my favourite in the series, and we got a free copy just for buying a computer. It was included alongside. So I was moving away from the console gaming at this point in time towards the PC, and the only computer games I actually have this for from this time, period of time are the original Tomb Raider trilogy. We've got Tomb Raider 1 there, and then we had the sequel, Tomb Raider 3, where Lara Croft really took off as an international icon. I've got a few other games that we picked up over the years. One of the oddest and weirdest is probably the Doctor Who game, Destiny of the Doctors. This is a very odd collection. I hope to go back and revisit someday. Uh, as the time went on and computers became just a little bit more sophisticated, we picked a load up. But I actually, my next computer game was something of a retro game. I've featured it on the channel already in a sort of memorial to Clive Sinclair because there was a version of this game on the ZX Spectrum but I'm actually the proud owner of the Microsoft DOS version of Dalek Attack where this strange, bizarre tie-in was released on a floppy disk. This is the only computer game I have that would be, um, I'd require a floppy disk drive to pay. CDs were the future and once they started uh, to adapt to DVD franchise we then had Tomb Raider 4, The Last Revelation. That was a very good game for the series. And then Tomb Raider Chronicles. And this kind of was where my love affair with PC gaming started to end. Because that original PC, the one that was provided with Tomb Raider 2 alongside it as a free tie-in, it wasn't powerful enough to play Tomb Raider Chronicles. It could get through the majority of the game. But there was a cutscene with strange lighting effects and a firestorm of lightning bolts striking the ground. It's an unskippable cutscene and every time the game tried to play it, it would crash. And there was no way forward. Even the level select code wouldn't get me out of it because I'd have to watch the cutscene. I did get a few other computer games at the time. My love of Lara Croft wasn't exclusive to Lara, it was the gameplay type. I didn't discriminate and I did try Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine. That's a really good spin-off, taking Indiana Jones and focusing on something to be quite equivalent to those early Lara Croft adventures. Then we have Battlefield 2. This was the big one. Uh, the original Battlefield was pretty good, but it was 2 that got me into the franchise. My best friend took me down to um, game, we purchased a copy, and we played online at LAN parties for many, many exciting days and hours. And the last PC game I bought in that period probably would be Spore. Ah, from the creator of The Sims, as it proudly says in the box. It was a really interesting game and a really interesting idea. It didn't quite deliver up to the promise of delivery. It did, however, do one thing that just put me off PC gaming for a long time. It was the first time I encountered the horrors of digital rights management. And I was distraught when I took this game home, put it into my computer and was told, I could only install it four times before the disc would become locked. I almost took it back to the shop and said I don't want it. So, it's not a very large PC games collection, but I'm quite proud of it. They were all, all of them meant something quite special to me. And it was at this point of time that I decided I really ought to go back to consoles. So here, I think the Dreamcast games can go here. Of course, being a Sega fan, and my friends had a PlayStation 1, so I had access to all of the PlayStation games I wanted to play. But no one I knew owned a Dreamcast. I don't know why that didn't put me off. No one I knew owned a Sega Saturn even. I skipped that console generation. But the Dreamcast, well, it had Sonic Adventure coming out. So, let's start putting those games away. The first game alphabetically would be Choo Choo Rocket. <laughs> That's a really exciting puzzle platform. I'd love to see this get a comeback. It shouldn't be an expensive re release. Uh, it'd be nice to see this remastered, upgraded, and released for the modern market, because I think they could do a lot with fun titles like that. Relatively cheap ones. Purchased several years later, secondhand, I don't have the case for it, but it's a good game, Dino Crisis. This uh, takes the old classic Resident Evil formula uh, and replaces zombies with dinosaurs. It's an uh, instant classic. Then we have Echo, Defender of the Future. Now, it's not as much of a classic as the original two-dimensional ones on the Mega Drive, but I've got a lot of love for this. It features Tom Baker, the fourth Doctor, providing voice narration of a really weird and bizarre science fiction plot. It's trying so hard, and it's got so many good ideas, but the camera, always the camera in these early 3D games. 
it just there's been several other sort of even most recently one where you play as a shark man eater developing on this concept that was put down here it really was a good game for the time but it's aged quite horrifically then we have a true brilliant game I don't own Blood Omen I never played it back in the day but I did play quite early on the Legacy of Cain's Soul Reaver this was the point where I discovered Amy Hennig who would go on to work for Naughty Dog develop the Uncharted franchise one of the best video game writer directors in the industry over the last 25 years and her work on Soul Reaver the voice artist the guy who plays Raziel Cain and the Elder God if you've never heard of this franchise do yourself a favor check it out it is worth every bit of your time and I would love a remaster of this but I really if they do remaster I hope they don't change that much just give it the graphical touch-up it needs then we've got some multiplayer brawlers that we had two controllers for the Dreamcast and we made good use of them with two games in this series. The original Power Stone, which is a four play, up to four player uh, three dimensional isometric brawler. And it's so good that we went and purchased the sequel, Power Stone 2. Now, I can't remember precisely the difference between these two games. They're both pretty good for different reasons. They've got quite a fun level design. The characters are quite exciting, dynamic. There's loads to play around with here. and. Yeah, a lot of hours pumped into it, but I probably haven't touched them in years. What's next on the list? Ah, this one is definitely well regarded by the community. The Dreamcast got a port of Quake Free Arena. PC gaming master race, taken to consoles. I didn't buy a keyboard and mouse adapter for the Dreamcast. I just tried to play it with the console, and I had a great time. Can't say I've ever been the biggest first person shooter fan, but this really hooked me for a very long period of time. Then possibly one of my favourite non-Sonic early 3D platformers, Rayman 2. This game solved every problem that Mario 3D left out. And people don't like to admit it, but Mario 3D, Mario 64 had a lot of problems. But Rayman, this is just how you take a two-dimensional action character, a platformer, and take it to the third dimension. And again, I'd love to see this remastered with minimal changes. It's a shame Michael and Cells left the industry. Revolt, uh, a sh racing game, quite an interesting one. Um, I re yeah, it's like Micro Machines, but not as good is probably the only way I can summarise it. It played pretty well on the Dreamcast. I do remember it fondly, but not not in as much vivid detail as Micro Machines. Definitely was enjoyable to muck around with, but it didn't get the love it deserved. Then we have Resident Evil Code Veronica. This would be the first Resident Evil game that I purchased and owned for myself. I played Resident Evil 2 on a friend's PlayStation 1. I watched as Resident Evil 3 came out and watched them play parts of it. And Code Veronica was the first one that I ever saw on a console I owned and thought, I'm getting that. And I'm so glad I did. It's a really exciting title. And to finish this box, I think we'll end with Shenmue. I never played this when it was cutting edge on the Dreamcast. I purchased it a few years later because I thought it would be an interesting collectible. This is one of the few instances of me going, yeah, I do want a collectible game. Because for a long time, this redefined what open world games were. I think GTA 3 probably blew, blew this out of the water and so many other games have taken this concept and run further with it. But Shenmue was a landmark in the industry when it came out. I don't have any personal attachment to it myself though. It's just, yeah, it's pretty good. So, then we get to the big one. And the reason I bought a Dreamcast. We have Sonic Adventure. I can't really say much more than this. Check out my video reviewing that game because it means so much to me on so many levels. It means almost as much to me as its sequel, Sonic Adventure 2. And here's one thing I bet you didn't know. When it was released, Sonic Adventure 2 came in the United Kingdom with a free orange phone offer of the game. That seems really quaint now. Buy a video game and get a mobile phone offer. Orange, of course, now have been replaced and taken over by EE Entertainment Everywhere. And then we have Sonic Shuffle, the black sheep of the Sonic Dreamcast releases. It tried to be Mario Party. It didn't quite manage it. It's an interesting game. Shall we leave it with that? Interesting. 
few more releases to put in here. Oh, here is an obscure one that I did never put the time it deserved to really discover it. The Spirit of Speed. It's a racing game set on 1937 vintage cars. I remember playing around with it, really struggling and moving on. And I think we'll do exactly the same now. What's next? Ah, the Star Wars collection. So, of course, the Dreamcast came out around the time Star Wars Episode One did, the prequel trilogy, and everywhere was pod racing. Probably the best thing the prequels brought to the franchise. Never really been reproduced or picked up again anywhere else, but this was a really exciting, surprisingly efficient game. Yeah, I've got a lot of positive memories about this one. I have less positive memories about my other Dreamcast Star Wars game, Demolition. I mean, in concept, it sounds like a good idea. Get aboard one of the vehicles, because there are some fantastic vehicles in the Star Wars franchise, and drive around blowing stuff up, but yeah, this game always just felt quite bitty and inconsequential. I think once you're in a really big mech, you know, blowing stuff up should be cool, but it just feels like Lego bricks. Star Wars and Lego bricks, that's an interesting concept we might come to later. Then I bought another copy of Tomb Raider The Last Revelations. I don't think I ever actually finished it on PC. I think it was the Dreamcast copy I bought a few years later that I finished it on. It was a very, very difficult game. And it includes Paul Oakenfield remixes of the music. I don't know if I've seen them recently. So we'll finish the last Dreamcast game of the collection is Worms World Party. I think anyone with a 90s video game collection probably ought to have a Worms game in their collection somewhere. It's a really fun and important party franchise. I don't think we can quite stop there. Before I have a brief break, I should say at this point that my brother had purchased a Sony PlayStation 2, the console that killed the Dreamcast. And we neither of us really knew much about role-playing games. You might notice the one significant deviation from this collection. There's a distinct lack of role-playing games. It was Final Fantasy X that put me onto that franchise. And having played Final Fantasy X on his PlayStation 2, I of course had to go back and discover where it all began. I didn't have a Nintendo Entertainment System, so I couldn't do that. But what I could buy was Final Fantasy VII. Even though I played this a console generation later, and I never really had much faith in the three-dimensional polygonal graphics of the PlayStation 1. I mean, there were some fun games in there, but they looked ugly. But despite that challenge, Final Fantasy VII was a fantastic game, and I absolutely adored replaying it after finishing Final Fantasy X. What I then did was went out and bought a copy of Final Fantasy VIII, and I don't know what there is about it. It's a good game. I started it and tried to replay it several times. The story starts really strong, but I always sort of got lost halfway through. It looked better, it sounded better, it played fine, but something never quite clicked for me. It did eventually, but it took me a very long time and I never finished my original PlayStation version of the game. So, those are the only games from the original two Sony consoles I actually purchased for myself. It was a long time before I'd go back to that system because I had access to those games from friends. No, once Sega had died, I knew that I was switching over to a new console manufacturer. I had access to Sony already, and I would later get access to Microsoft through other friends. My future would end up with Nintendo. But I think that might be our next video.